choose not to live in a world of filters. Realize your mistakes, set the foundation for your success, get some wins. Knucklehead Podcast. What's up, everybody? I'm talking to you. This is Knucklehead Podcast coming at you. We got Dan Bernard, local business owner. Uh, he doesn't want me to talk about his military experience, but he's a military guy also. Um, so we have that in common. Um, actually got a ton of stuff going on, a lot to learn from. Excited for you to learn from this guy. We're gonna, um, you and I just know each other like we've only got together a few times. Yeah, through uh, so, Bunker Labs, I believe. Yeah, we went to uh, we went to an event where actually it's kind of, that's kind of a funny story. That is, go ahead and uh, tell it. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, it's for those of you who uh, who have ever had an experience with uh, with Bunker Labs. It's it's um, it's well intended. I'll just put it to you that way, right? I'm not I'm not going to get overly critical of him here, but well, no, I, I, will, I, have, I don't have any criticism for Bunker Labs. I I look at where was the host that day? I look at you know I mean San Antonio, we're looking at him. We're looking at him. San, yeah. Well, San Antonio. Well, That's we, true. You know the host actual was in San Antonio, but we kind of like took over. Yes, I think did. Bunker Labs is is a bit like an umbrella. Okay. There's a lot at the top. Okay. But then underneath the umbrella, you can place things that are interchangeable that come and go. Yep. But the umbrella's only got like a strong base, and then it's got a canvas, you know, large top. And so everything in between is kind of narrow. Interesting. Yeah. So um, so the options in, while you're in between the base I've never heard it like and that you're before. in between the top. Yeah. You know, it's it's a process getting to the top, coming from the bottom. But once you get to the top, you're fine. I like how you said that. It's yeah. A process. It's a process getting from the uh, bottom to the top. Well, that day, um, whoever was at the top forgot to tell somebody in the middle to show up. So, <laughs> so you and I had to, uh, well, when I say you and I, I really mean you. You had to uh, facilitate that class, did a great job. You really kind of coagulated support from everybody. Yeah. And it was cool. You could tell that you have had some experience doing that. Yeah. Guys who, you know, in the absence of leadership, they always step up and, and lead. So yeah. that's what you did. Well, and luckily, I would be considered someone of a sophisticated startup type person. Okay. Like I've I've had a couple of years in it now, and I've got a lot of experience. So people who maybe haven't had that luxury of experience in that realm yep. are probably a little bit more reticent to step up because they are coming from a position of um, basically low information, so to speak. So they don't really like know what to say or how to offer it. They're afraid that they're they're uh, everyone else in the room is smarter than they are. Sure. So there's a little bit of um, intimidation yeah, for, for, sure. for people in that situation, yep. for a fact, I think. And yep. so I, if you're not scared of rejection and you're not scared of you know what people think about you, then yeah, you're gonna have someone like me who, you know, it's, I'll be like, I'm just gonna initiate the conversation and see where it goes. That's cool. Yeah. That's risky, but at the same time, uh, there's a risk reward. Yeah. And in most cases, like you know, you can trust your judgment. You've been there, done that. So yeah. Well, you also, know the conversation's gonna go okay. No pain, no gain, right? That is, uh, that is true. And I've been through a lot of pain, so. Yeah. Well, I, I, <laughs> you can elaborate on some of that if you want. But um, so what I wanted to uh, talk about real quick, and then I, and then we'll jump right into this. Yeah. Is and so the point of the podcast, and it's and it's important to start with why. The reason why we started this is to more often than not. People, uh, people who made mistakes, and it kind of ties into the point you were just talking about. Mm-hmm. People make mistakes. Yes. However, we live in a world right now where it's not encouraged for people to make mistakes. It's actually encouraged for people to do things perfect. Yeah, and people I would, like to I agree. Put, and people like to put forward a uh, a front via filters that they select. Yeah. On an image. Yeah. And uh, and the reason why uh, the reason why we started this podcast is. Nothing significant and nothing actually worthwhile is done. That's done mm-hmm. is done doing perfectly the first time. Yes, because typically the second time somebody does it, it's done better. Yeah, and that person mm-hmm. that uh, that uh, the reason why they can do it uh, better the second time is because they learn from the first person's mistakes. Yeah, it's the whole early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese outlook. Seriously, yeah, I mean it's true. It's it, totally true. I mean nobody wants to be the MySpace of anything. Yes, right. Yeah. You know, everybody's like, oh, I want to be Facebook. But you know, who doesn't love Tom? Tom's still out there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I He's got him, a bunch of friends. I sent him an email, you know, every well. every now and then, like, hey Tom, <laughs> I'm thinking about you, mm-hmm. and just to because uh, like the guys. The guy's a nice guy. Yeah, he's brilliant. He's out there somewhere. Yeah. And so I just like try and like send him some encouragement, you know. But like how do you come down off that cloud I don't know. where you're like that that fifteen minute that fifteen minutes of fame and success, like yep. and then you kinda come back down to reality and uh, you go on and do other great things, but maybe they don't get as much attention as that one thing did. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, kinda like you know, I hate to use this comparison, but like kinda like one hit wonder. Yeah. In the music industry. Yeah. 
And you know, like the Tom's probably done like other hits, but unfortunately, we just don't know about them. No, no, we don't. And only Tom does. Yeah. The thing is, is um, I think society or even individuals as a whole, they they, um, they they get encouragement from places that are well-meaning but aren't necessarily vetted. So, for instance, they may get a an attaboy from their mom. Well, that's not necessarily going to go help them go close an A round of funding if Partici- they start up. Participation know trophy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. so, and so, my my encouragement and the reason for this podcast is to is to communicate with entrepreneurs, guys who are sales uh, executives or sales. Um, I want to say sales leaders, just pioneers in their business where mm-hmm. they're going out and not a demand fulfillment, but a more of a demand generation type role where they have yeah. to go out and carve their own market, create their own market. Do you think that's a genetic thing? Do you think that there's like genetically uh, predispositioned people who want to be the pioneer of an industry? You know, I don't know. Um, I think, I think that there's, I think it's an error in everybody. And there's some people who they feed that and there's some people who get scared of it and they mm-hmm. tell and run. Yeah, and my encouragement for for people is, hey, listen, it, put yourself out there. You're going to fail. Yeah, but uh, don't let that failure stop you from continuing to make progress. Yeah, I think and that's it, what this is. I think that's it boils down is. to like the base of like fight or flight. Yeah, you know what? Sure. What is your general leanings? And of course, you know, like how you're raised, the environment you grew up in and exist in, all has like um, a great impact on that. But I think in communities like here in Austin, I think there's a lot of encouragement for people to take those risks because of the culture that we're surrounded by. You go down to San Antonio or Dallas or Houston, you know, they're going to be like, Hey, you know, Houston for se, if you're not per se Houston, if you're not in the oil industry, then what are you doing in Houston? Because this is what we do here. Yeah. So there's definitely, I think like a cultural aspect that is uh, unique to places like Seattle, LA, New York, Miami, that, kind of uh, host that type of thinking. For sure. Yeah, I mean, you go up to like Kansas, even Kansas has got like a startup uh, area that has been kind of like uh, grown and matured over time. And I think uh, just like the entrepreneurial way of thinking has become popular in recent past. And I think where before you kind of like maybe like people didn't know what an entrepreneur did where now they, they have a much better idea thanks to Shark Tank and some other things. I think it's much more acceptable in the community to be kind of like an entrepreneur. Yeah. And like, you know, growing up in my community, I grew up in Central Texas. So predominantly everyone worked for the oil companies or they worked agriculture or they were in government jobs of some, to- some type or sort. Or, uh, you know, they were whatever was in like the local area that, you know, kind of like goes hand in hand with that. And I think now, you know, it's okay from the area that I'm that I've been in to be like a podcast celebrity on YouTube, like Demolition Ranch. Uh, that guy is from you know Bernie, Texas, where I'm from, but he's gone huge in social media because he's got a great personality and the way he approaches the problems that that arise is been very very popular and well received and entertaining. Sure. So now you don't necessarily have to work at the feed store to start out, you can just go straight to YouTube and make a, you know, a national brand for yourself. For sure. Well, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned it and you kind of finished with that point, a national brand for yourself. Mm-hmm. Is it okay to talk about? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so tell us about American Grip. What, what is that? Okay. And, and how did it start? Because you're, that's not your background. Your background isn't necessarily manufacturing, no. heavy engineering, and manufacturing solution. Correct. You're a, you're a uh, military guy. Yes, and yeah. And that means you, you know a problem, so you try to solve that problem. Mm-hmm. So tell us about America. Yeah, so this year I'm going to hit 15 years in the military, and I'm in the Texas Army National Guard now. And so basically, America Grip was a way to um, channel my already pre-existing creativity and my drive and ambition. And a lot of people who uh, come up with ideas and things like that don't really know like where to start okay. or what to do with them. So I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. Okay. Uh, grew up doing construction, worked my way through college, joined, did ROTC, non-scholarship, and got my commission. Really? Yeah. So I really like, you know, when I, we'll get we'll get to like when I was younger, like what I would tell myself now versus then. Sure. But uh, really, is a way for me to take my natural ability to create and come up with concepts and execute those concepts and take the lessons learned on the battlefield in Iraq and basically say these things, these items need to be manufactured for the good and the welfare of the common soldier and first responders because no one's making it. Um, and what I learned later on is that the gun industry in general is not really open like to new ideas. Sure. It's really set in their ways. There's a lot of innovation going on in the gun industry, but it's really hard to get it adopted. I mean, look at Magpul. Magpul just became the first, uh, they just got accepted by the Marine Corps to be 
their uh, P mag replacements for their their steel magazines. Yeah. Interesting. Think how long Magpul's been around? Fifteen years. And, not not and, as long as Smith and Wesson. That's for sure. Yes. Not exactly. And so, uh, just the fact that it takes that long for things to be adopted and to come around. There is a lot of innovation. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. But it, even the guys who have a lot of money backing them, they struggle to you know, maintain their foothold and grow their foothold. Because the old way of thinking was if you're not in guns and ammo, if you're not in certain magazines, then you're not in the industry. Interesting. And so now like people like me who were doing a lot of social media outreach and people like me who are doing a lot of uh, podcasting, interviews, Instagram, and all that stuff, yeah. we have a very disruptive way of entering the marketplace for a low cost. So we're not gonna spend $10,000, $15,000 on one magazine ad that maybe someone looks at, maybe they don't, mm. or maybe they see it six months from now, or maybe they don't. It's a different type of collateral in a way that you're Correct. going to market with. Yeah, and so we're, yeah, so we're leveraging the social media aspects to gain faster share of the market, but also to spread brand awareness. Sure. And you don't get... So it's, it sounds like, I mean, even consumer behavior is affecting a, an existing B2B industry Absolutely. like yours. I Absolutely. Mean, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. And so think about this. So think about, like, so we had, huh. during the Obama administration, hmm. we had eight straight years of panic buying. Yeah. Everyone buying everything. Sure. Every time that they talked about taking guns away, the gun store... Uh, shelves would be cleared out. Yeah. So there's all this money uh, going, coming going from the end user, from the manufacturers, yeah. and they're buying everything. So everyone's jumping into the market, and there's uh, there can be low cost to entry in that market, and there can be high cost to entry depending on machining and things you want to do. So for myself, I built my business, so if I have to deploy for the military, it can run itself. So, so everything is very automated. I don't mean to I don't mean to stop you. Let's go back to when you're evaluating the getting started thought process mm -hmm. so uh, how did you develop momentum differently than somebody who's got a good idea they've already got a vehicle mm -hmm. most most of our audience right now has a job yeah most of our audience right now has uh, an idea mm -hmm. and most of our audience right now is scared so much so that if they lose that original job mm -hmm. that they're not going to be able to fund that idea yeah so there's that risk you have to make a very uh, educated decision on that risk so the risk reward we we're talking i think we talked about previously in our conversation about how people in the military will write a check up to the amount of their life when they deploy yep. and when they're day-to-day -day operations but as soon as they shut down for the day and they roll out the post and they go back home that risk-taking uh factor completely upturns itself 180 degrees and they and people in the military go to being very low risk oriented yeah, but as soon as they sure. get back on post they're like okay i'm gonna go jump out an airplane today because i'm airborne yeah. but as soon as they drive off post they're like i'm not writing a check for 500 dollars to get my idea made or get my idea on a blog or get my idea or send out free samples to people and i think uh one of the biggest things too is people are just afraid to share their ideas period they're afraid someone's going to steal it or someone's going to run off with it and i'll tell you right now the odds of someone stealing your idea are very slim because one, it takes time, it takes money, it takes effort to to, yeah. to to take that and run with sure. it. It happens a lot on Kickstarter. There are dedicated companies that steal from Kickstarter ideas. Uh -huh. So while people are trying to get spooled up on Kickstarter, they're selling Chinese knockoffs on Amazon while you're still in day two of your Kickstarter. Interesting. And they, the ability to copy things is really, really fast. But if you don't if you don't share your ideas, mm -hmm. It's never going to go anywhere. And a lot of people sit on their ideas, and then a year or two later, they see their idea that someone else went, took that risk and sure. went out and made it. Um, okay, so that very easily could have happened for you. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like it did. Or did it? No, no, no one sold my idea. Interesting. Okay, no, cool. I did, right. what I did is I, I actually started out with uh, a different concept, and then it evolved into something else. So when I was in Iraq, every time we roll up to a... Uh, well, let me back up. When I was in Iraq, I was the brigade engineer for the 89th MPs. Okay. So I had a lot of engineering jobs and duties while I was there, and I was also a contracting officer. So when I was in Iraq, we had to build, rebuild the Triple CI, which is the Supreme Court of the Iraqi government. We had a lot of projects that were occurring, like rebuilding water lines, electrical lines. We had to provide power to places that had been knocked out of water. Yeah. And so we'd roll up to an area. So we'd have a Leatherman on us or a Gerber or something like that. And the problem that we had was... Uh, if your Leatherman Gerber wasn't broke, that was unusual because you use it so much. Yeah. Uh, you would lose it by dropping it while on patrol or in the armored vehicle and you don't realize you lost it. And then lastly, it's in your pack because you have to down your gear and go, and go on the mission 
And so you leave your pack in your up armored vehicle because of the um, basically you want to be light yeah, I got and it. agile sure. and flexible while you're outside. You got to prioritize what you carry. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what I decided was, what are the things I take everywhere with me? Well, I take my my armor, my molly. I take you know my my uniform, and then I, the, only, the only other things that you really take everywhere with you is like your helmet and your weapon. So I was like, okay. I'm gonna make a tool system that rides organically on your weapon. And it's gonna be so subtle that you're gonna forget it's there. But when you do need it, it will be there. And so it's just a clip on tool system. And so when you go out somewhere, and in Iraq, you know, very Western in a lot of ways, very European oriented when it comes to like uh, tools, machinery, and things that they work on. Yeah. So I was like, okay, great. So if I use two inch bits, those are replaceable anywhere I go in the world. If I go to Afghanistan, if I go to Iraq, there's always gonna be a two inch bit drive anything there. So if I lose my tools, it's easily replaceable. Sure. And then on top of that, I was like, okay, it's gotta be cheap enough for your average soldier to afford. And so like, when you lose a Leatherman, a Gerber, or a Multitasker, which are all great tools, it hurts financially. Yeah. And so my whole uh, design idea was like, it's gotta be robust, it's gotta be af affordable and easily replaceable in theater. And it has to be able, the panels, when you clip them together, make a micro tool. But those panels also need to be able to function independently for quick adjustments. And so then what I learned was that um, star drives work on Allen wrench screws, because that was the debate. Do I do Allen or do I do star drive? Well, it turns out star drive works on both. Hmm. And really what I was looking for was just something that would last me a deployment yeah. at, at the least, and that if um, it could also absorb heat from the weapon, yeah. that was great. So we went with an ABS, ABS nylon material, so that helps uh, alleviate heat from the weapon, but also when you're out in the desert sun, it's 130 out and it sucks you're not getting heat off the panels either. It's for, you know, like when we went, everything had a, a, a Picatinny rail. Okay. And so my system's Picatinny rail oriented, but the Picatinny rail is like a cheese grater. If you're not, if you don't have gloves on, it chews you up. Sure. And so the whole idea behind the tool grip and then behind my other multi-tool, the dagger tool, was portability, portability, cost, dependability, and also for like our dagger tool that I created with the help of Chris Hernandez. He's also a uh, police officer out in Houston. We designed a system of a, uh, it's basically like tongs with barbs on the end. And you can actually remove a case of separation from the rear of the weapon instead of having to rot it with a, uh, a cleaning rod or anything else. So you don't, one, you don't damage the rifling in your barrel. And then two, you can clear a case of separation in six seconds on a slow day. Wow. Yeah. Now, most people do crack open the weapon, but if you're on a cruiser weapon, you just have the little top panel. Yeah. You, so on a saw, we had a lot of case, case head separations in Iraq because our, the casings on the ammo just sucked. Sure. I don't know what contractor was providing it, but it wasn't that great. So we had a lot of case head separations. So being able to pop up that panel, clear it from reverse, from a little multi-tool that you can have on your molly or you can have on your gear or wherever, and be able to get back in the fight in six seconds, it takes you longer to reload that weapon yeah, that's, than, that, than clearing the weapon. Yeah. So that was one of and our factors. And if you a hot ammo and a hot metal yeah. and it's hot outside and yeah. else too. Well, and imagine something too that you can take out, shove in there, shove out, and you can throw it in your pocket or you can, you know, it, the, uh, slap the, back on to the, 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 the Texas barrel. edition fits in your magpul pistol grip. Oh, really? Yeah, so easily accessible. We had to be easily accessible. Yep. You had to be able to use it with gloves. Okay. And you had to be able to depend on it for multiple uses. And for so sure. that's what we designed for all those systems. Where did you where did you mess up? Where did you make a mistake that you can talk about? Where you're like, you know what? I thought I had this figured out. Uh, I can talk about this mistake because uh, I learned from it. Oh well, there's there's everyone makes a ton of mistakes. I think the best part about mistakes is learning from your mistakes. For sure. And like, you don't dwell on your mistakes. That's very important. If you make a mistake, uh, evaluate it, figure out where, what you could have done better, and right. then move on. Don't don't basically get stuck on what went wrong because then you can't move forward. Just keep moving forward. You know, annotate, take down notes on what went wrong so you don't repeat that mistake, but sure. just keep moving forward. Yeah, for sure. I would say where I made a mistake is, well, this is going to be kind of like a weird comment. So, like, I made a mistake by not taking money, but I made the right move by not taking money. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because by not taking money, that yeah. gave me the freedom to follow my ideas and yeah. not have anyone putting pressure on me to go a certain direction or to make sales or to... Uh, create other things, sure. I was able to do everything at my own pace yeah. and my own cost. So I didn't have anyone pushing me saying like, well, you took X amount of dollars from me, I own X amount of equity in my company from you. So I think I think bootstrapping yourself is ideally the best way to go because then you have full control of your destiny, you can do whatever you want, yeah. and the reward at the end of it will be much greater. Now, now those lessons that you learned with costs associated with that, because I mean, you, one is oh, time, yeah. right? Yeah. There's an opportunity to cost of time. Yeah. 
uh, what, what would be? Well, for example, like, so they told, when I started this, several investors here in town told me that I needed at a minimum $100,000 to do right. just the initial, like the patent, to do the development and then do the packaging and all just the stuff just so you can get to the starting line. And I told them, uh, no, I don't need that much money. I was like, I'm going to do it for way less than that because of 3D printing, because of the uh, manufacturing costs that yeah. were, you know, at that point in time, manufacturing was an all-time low in the United States. Sure. So going out and getting mold for my, for my product was only about $15,000, where everyone that I quoted was like $25,000. Oh, wow. So I was able to really cut costs by being smart about where I purchased. Mistakes I made, uh, I would say... Like, for example, like, I did texture on the grips. Well, the texture's great. I did a 1911 finish because I was all about function over form. But if I had done a flatter texture on the grips, then laser engraving would have been much easier. Sure. So that's an expensive mistake. But it's also, I wanted function. So I got my function, and I can still laser engrave over it. Yeah. But the uh, the definition that my competitors get on their laser engraving, yeah. because they don't have a texture they're working with, is definitely one of those things I'd probably go back and redo. That's one of those things where I've heard it said, uh, like, you, you slip in the shower doesn't mean that you're ever ne you're never going to take a shower. Again. Yeah, like, yeah. Like ah, it just it just happens. You make that mistake. Yeah. You keep on dust yourself off. And when I do Gen two, the grips they'll be flatter for sure. Okay. But right. yeah, that's no not, that, so that was a bit of a design mistake. But, but those are things you learn along the way. But it didn't cost me any money. Um, how would it, how does that tie into? I mean, because you you've got a you've got a, a great energy about um, you know what it is that you're doing. But you're not you're not just doing that. You're doing a lot right now. Correct. So, yeah. So how do you? I mean, do you feel burnt out in any way, shape, or form? Never. Okay. Never. And do you feel like you have energy misdirected going to one spot as opposed to all of it concentrated all the time? No, because I very much believe that you should focus on what you're good at, okay. and then you should hire out what you're not good at. Because you're never going to get good at things you're not good at. You sure. know what I mean? Because, yeah. like, for instance, so like I'm really great at the design, the concept, the execution. Sure. Uh, I'm, I suck at marketing. You know, marketing you know, through social media is something I definitely need help with. You know, marketing is always this this beast that you have to tackle sure. because it can go in any direction. And if you don't get help focusing your marketing uh, help with yeah. that for me, yeah. then I would completely fail whatsoever. I have to go and get expertise where I'm weakest. And marketing is probably one of the weakest. I'm great at networking. Okay. I'm great at doing the conferences and things like that. I'm great at doing, and I, I need help engineering. Sure. I can't tell you what the melting temperature of ABS nylon is because I'm not an engineer. Sure. I, went to, I did three years of civil engineering at school and then I switched over to business, but I don't, I don't have the, uh, the uh, technical knowledge to do a computer model that's going to tell me where my breaking point is or sure. not at. So things like that that are very like specific expertise points, I have no problem going and telling people I need help with that because I'm not that smart. It's interesting you mentioned those details because knowing all those details is the reason why people would use as an excuse not to do something. Correct. You know yeah. I mean? Yeah. And yeah, you can't just... let you can't let detail. So like it's better to have a partial plan than a perfect plan. Sure. And I can hire someone to tell me the details and fill in the gaps. So when I do go to people, I can be an expert on it yeah. once I've been educated on it on my own product, which sounds kind of funny, but it's completely no, true. Sense. No, it's actually. all about R&D. Yeah. R&D is a big factor. That's awesome. And I would say too, like one of the mistakes that I made was early on, I think I was devoting too much time to it. Really? Yeah. I think I was devoting way too much time to it early on. Because you think it's because you were scared of that? Like, no, it's because I was excited. Oh, really? Was, I was excited. Yeah, I wanted, fascinating. I wanted, I, I wanted to like get after it, and I wanted things to move yeah. faster. And so if I had relaxed a little bit more and let things percolate, things take time. Sure. And so as things you know come in, you're like, okay, great. That hit, this benchmark hit, boom. This next one should hit. It's kind of like a Pacific Rim where they're predict predicting the monsters coming out of the ocean. They're like, ah, that one came in at this time. This other one's be two times faster. Oh my gosh. So yeah, so it basically you uh, you have to learn to balance the highs and the lows. Okay. And it took me about a year to balance out the highs and lows because these great things happen and then it's kinda like then you kinda go through the valley of death is what I call it. So boom, you hit your benchmark, things are great. And then there's a little bit of a lull, a trough, you know, there's a trough. Yeah. And then you got to, then you get to the next peak. Yeah. And so there's a valley of death in between and you have to be patient and you have to learn to bring yourself down, calm your mind yep. about those valleys of death. Cause you're going to make it through the valley of death. Hopefully, as long as you maintain your cost structure, your supply structure, everything in place. And so I think, you know, I would go back and tell myself like be more patient in the, in between times. That's what, that's, that was my next question. You, you, you answered 
uh, one of them before I asked it. It was really good. So yeah. that was one thing. Yes. Yeah. And then be more patient. What, what I would what go, two more things. What I'd go back so. and tell myself too is that your network is more important than your resume. People okay. don't care about your resume. Resume is just get your get your foot in the door. Sure. I think I'd go back to my younger self and in college I would say start working much more on your uh, network and you know in uh, the legislature, yeah. working on my networks in the business world, but yeah. also working on my network in the engineering world as well, and IT world as well. Interesting. Yeah. What's, uh, what's one last thing that you would tell yourself? Save your money. Really? Save your money. So I would go back and tell myself to stack cash and wait for the right opportunity. Now, I yeah. created my own opportunity because I wasn't, I wasn't seeing the opportunities that I wanted to do. Sure. So I created my own opportunity. So don't be afraid to create your own opportunities if you see a niche that you can fill. Because it's all about the pain point. I saw a pain point from the military aspect. Yeah. Some people don't see that as a, a pain point. They say like, oh, well, you're adding weight to the weapon. Well, guess what? After the flashlights and the handles and all the go fast gear you strap to it. It's almost like you should like contact another contracting officer to write a contract for American. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. Like, what's, what's the uh, rapid equipping yeah, force seriously. in the Army? Yeah, we've told Code of Federal Regulations said that uh, in the FAR. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to make Mattis edition ones. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so General Mattis, he's got some on the way. That's nice. Um, but yeah, so like I would say you want to so like if you're risk adverse yep. save money so that you can take advantage of opportunities that arise and I think in the next three years a lot of opportunities are going to happen whether the economy does well or the economy does bad yep. as long as you were liquid you have more power with liquid assets than you do with an idea sure. and if you can match liquidity with the idea at the right place at the right time you're going to be very successful yeah, that's a good suggestion yeah that's a good suggestion yeah and what's what's luck or preparedness and opportunity. Well, I mean, you tell me. I mean, I got my own luck, definition. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. That's luck. Right place, right time, and you're ready. For sure. Yeah. That's good uh, That's good stuff right there, man. Um, well, I appreciate you taking the time today, buddy. We, yeah, we, pleasure. We can't, we can't get into everything. Yeah, so, yeah, time we'll have, we'll have to. Uh, we'll have to make this happen again some other time. But there is there is a, one last thing. What is, uh, what is Fathom Academy? Okay, so Fathom Academy, I'm currently the director of sales for Fathom Academy. Okay. And what that is, that is the first indoor, to my knowledge, one of the first, uh, indoor clean water training facilities for first responders for flood and swift water operations. Where is so it's in North Austin. Okay. It's up by Breaker and I-35. And so it's a, basically, it's a water tank yep. where you can train people with, we have pumps that create an environment of stress. And we also create a three to four knot current for first responders to train in with a submerged vehicle. Wow. So if you want to practice day or night operations, any time of the day, and you want to recreate scenarios for uh, like what we encountered during Hurricane like Harvey. Flash flood. And the, yeah, and yeah, we can totally go in there and do that. Wow. And the cool thing about that is it's repeatable. Yep. It's one of the safest training environments in Texas right now. So like a lot of first responders get injured while doing water rescue training. They bounce their face off the wall of the facility. They get 41 stitches. The next thing you know, they're on workers compensation. And then you got to bring on another guy to replace that guy. Jesus. So you lose something like, I think the state of Texas has lost something like 14, 60 million dollars just to work men's compensation and injuries alone in water rescue training. So we can turn off the pumps. We have emergency shut off switches. And the whole point behind Fathom Academy is repeatability and training to the demands of what we face today every day. Yeah. So everything is basically um, adaptable to sure. every situation that occurs. Because every time a firefighter goes out or a policeman goes out, most likely they haven't had a whole lot of flood water rescue training. Yeah. And who's first on the scene is a fire is a usually a policeman who then calls a fireman to come out and do the water rescue training. So what we're looking to do is we're looking to level the playing field where every policeman can have some degree of water training, sure. and they can have a base knowledge of water operations and being in the current and what that feels like. So we want to train people not only to save lives of other people, but also to be able to save themselves. For sure. Because there's a lot of police officers that find themselves in real uh, nasty situations. In Texas, I don't know if you know or not, Texas is the number one state, I believe, for flood water deaths and injuries. No, I didn't yeah, know yeah. Texas is like the leading state in flood waters for flood because all the flash flooding that we have. That makes sense. Yeah. And then you look at all the hurricanes, and then you look at all the seasonal flooding that we have. For sure, we have a lot of need and necessity for that training. So that's basically, in a nutshell, that's what Fathom Academy is: wow. flood, swift water rescue training, and city water, which is clean and purified. You don't have to worry about flesh eating bacteria, amoebas. You don't have to worry about alligators. You don't have to worry about you know, all of the above. And you don't have to worry about the weather. How many sure. times have we? 
Or the time of day. I yes. mean, even just what you said before. I mean, if it's day or night training, regardless of the regardless of the day. Yes. Yeah. That's cool. That's enough plugs, David. I'm just, <laughs> All right. I'm just messing with you. Nice. So if you want to get water rescue training, yeah. fathomacademy.com okay. is Fathom the website. Academy. You can okay. go on the website. You can register for our classes. And then for America Grip, yep. you just go to www.americagrip.com. Not American, not America's, America Grip. America Grip. America Grip. Okay, so singular. Yes. Got it like one country. Yes. Like a sovereign nation in a way. Yes, because if you go to American, you're going to get a company that provides like equipment for film studios. And I thought the name was so unique. There would be no one even near that name because it's patriotic. And then sure enough, there's American Grip down in San Antonio. But we are the original America Grip, Got and it. Tool Grip is actually copyrighted for us. So you oh, can nice. type in Tool Grip, you should be able to find us. But we're on in- Instagram, America Grip, at yep. America Grip, Twitter, America Grip, Facebook, America Grip. And then also, you can, you know, if you want to call and reach us, we got our phone number on our website. That's awesome. And we do offer military and law enforcement discounts. He's a true hero. Yep. Patriot gives discounts to military folks. Hell yeah. Or, or full price. Whatever you want to call it. No, we call it a discount. Yeah, no, I actually, I actually give military a discount. Like, no, so many people like claim that you have yeah, a discount. Exactly. I'm going to give you a discount at the exact price that. You're welcome for my service. That's right. That's, exactly, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking some time. But Pleasure. That's awesome. Absolutely. It was great to Thanks. see you. Thanks. Luckway Podcast. Always check us out every Tuesday. New episodes coming at you. Get some wins. Join us next week for another edition of Knucklehead Podcast. <laughs>